From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Tatiana Garcia. Thank you for joining us. Tonight we take a look at the stories that literally bring you a taste of our state. From bread for the dead to sweets that support moms in need. And we look at where our food comes from. Farms in Arizona are shrinking. According to the USDA Census of Agriculture, Arizona farmland has steadily declined for the past 20 years. As Allison Hoskins reports, the allure of money from selling or just the struggle to keep the farm going are causing farmers to decide, sell off parts of their land or shut down completely. The Kerr family has been farming in Arizona since the 1940s. They started near Tempe, but as the city began to develop, they moved across the valley to the more rural Buckeye. Over the years, they've shut down two of their four farms. I was at the stage where farming and my, my dairy either needed to grow or get out. And it was to the point that I was just ready to get out. David Kerr says Phoenix used to have some of the most fertile farmland, but developments have forced farms to relocate to the edges of the valley. The trouble is we're being pushed out into areas where water is actually a shortage. The farm ground's not as good. It's, it's desert land that's being converted into farms. According to the Arizona Farm Bureau, most farms in Maricopa County are less than 10 acres, but dairy is still Arizona's leading agricultural product. One Kerr farmer says smaller can be better. When you look at the data, back in 1940, in the United States, there was 26 million dairy cows. Today, there's less than 9 million dairy cows. And with those 9 million dairy cows, we're producing more than twice the amount of milk that they had with 26 million dairy cows. Wes Kerr, David's nephew, said there are many reasons for better efficiency. The combination between better feed, um, better animals, better genetics, and then the environment that we get to keep the animals in. With all that efficiency, we need less cows to produce more milk. Jerry Kerr sold his dairy and now works for the Department of Agriculture. He's also seen decrease in land and crops from Casa Grande to the Colorado River. Oh, it's definitely decreased. When I started with uh, the organization I'm with now, there were almost 300,000 acres of cotton. This year I had 43,000. While farmland is shrinking, farming is a lifestyle that's hard to leave. Hey, you talk to any farmer and he would, he, would, he would probably tell you the same things I'm telling you. It's just, it's just a matter of fact type thing. I don't know anything else and don't want to. <laughs> Our state has a rich history of farming and ranching. They're even part of the state's five C's. Cotton, cattle, climate, citrus, and copper. Live in downtown Phoenix, Allison Hoskins, Cronkite News. A new report says children in Apache County have the nation's worst access to healthy food. Food insecurity is one of the top links to childhood obesity. Sabella Scalise is in Washington, D.C., where a panel of nutrition experts met to address the solutions which lie outside the family household. Nutrition experts say healthy food like this is high in demand, and restaurants and food industries need to react and be accountable. Kids' meals should have no junk in it. If we're embarrassed about what we're serving, let's change the food, not try to pretend that it's different. But while demand for healthier food is up, the supply is not there for some areas. Food deserts, like reservations in low-income urban areas, can mean a nutritious meal is miles away. It still continues to be a huge issue and one that we're going to have to approach in multiple ways to succeed at. Experts on the panel agreed that one possible solution is bringing the food to the kids. It is where school becomes critical. Many children eat two meals and a snack within those school districts and so we have to make sure they're getting the best possible food. When kids aren't in school, their access to food decreases even more. When the children come back from being off, they are so hungry because they didn't get any meals. So again, looking at the school lunch program and putting our so support behind it is imperative. Panelists say now larger changes can be made because more and more people are finally embracing healthier choices. That there are a lot of factors coming together now which gives us a chance to really make considerable progress. In Washington, D.C., Sabella Scalise, Cronkite News. We call the Apache County Public Health Department. They said the Arizona Nutrition Network is working with Apache County schools to teach students about proper nutrition and how to pick out the healthiest food from grocery stores. 
One in five families in Arizona are in need of emergency food that food banks can provide, but they don't usually have the healthiest options, and people with dietary restrictions usually can't eat what's been donated. Cronkite News reporter Natalie Taranjoli takes us to a special food bank filling those needs. Unfortunately, at least a good 70, 80 percent of boxes you get, you cannot eat. You literally can't eat. Marsha Burton is diabetic and has high blood pressure. She also relies on food banks to help her get by. Burton needs to eat healthy foods that are low in sodium and that won't raise her blood pressure. But when she gets a donation box and takes out everything she can't have, she isn't left with much. You're getting maybe four or five items you can actually eat. She recently discovered Cultural Cup Food Bank, where they focus on customizing donation boxes to people's religious or medical dietary restrictions. Burton was so happy she was able to take home food she can actually eat that she cried during her first visit. It was amazing to me. I was like, well, I'm actually going to get food I can eat, I can tolerate. I don't have to worry about my health. Other food banks are making the push towards healthier options as well. It's not just that canned food box anymore uh, that the food bank distributes. Jerry Brown said St. Mary's is giving away more fruits and vegetables than ever before, making up almost a third of all food distributed. They're also walking home with a bag of fresh celery or potatoes or carrots or whatever it is we have on hand at that point to give them a healthier option and to try to give that diet a real balance. Lower income or homeless population, we give them an atmosphere that, you know, we listen to their dietary needs. Sabia Keskin says Cultural Cup strives to give diet-friendly items to two or 3,000 families every month. At least it gives them a little bit of hope that they can get out of whatever problem that they're having. For Burton, her monthly food box means she won't be eating foods she shouldn't be and won't be hungry. In Phoenix, Natalie Taranjoli, Cronkite News. One way Phoenix is going green is through the Valley's biggest fair of the year. Cronkite News reporter Natalie Taranjoli visited the fair to get a closer look on how they'll use food for fuel. If you find yourself at the Arizona State Fair this year, chances are you'll indulge in some deep fried deliciousness. But whether you do or not, the oil that it, that it took to cook that food might be fueling your car. Piggly's Barbecue uses 40 to 50 gallons of oil per day to cook the food they sell at the fair. That's collected and turned into biodiesel. I believe in recycling. Instead of going to landfills or clogging drains, the converted oil is an alternative fuel source that burns cleaner than regular gasoline. Anything that we can recycle to keep from going into our landfills helps us all out. Piggly's Barbecue will contribute at least 1,000 gallons of that. Biotain pumping collects about that amount per week. The fair covers four weekends, so quite a bit of oil is used. Average, the past three years have been anywhere from about 35 to 4,200 gallons. So we're looking at least uh, 3,500 gallons again this year. All of those delicious fried fair foods should taste even better knowing that the oil they're cooked in isn't going to waste. Oh, I love it. I love it. They're doing a great job. It's great for the community, great for our environment, and uh, job well done. Last year, over 4,100 gallons were converted. I figure we use something out of oil. Last year's oil conversions were the equivalent to taking 108 cars off the road. Live in downtown Phoenix, Natalie Taranjoli, Cronkite News. A proposed change to an ordinance in Glendale could allow homeowners to raise unlimited amounts of chickens in their backyard, as long as they have 4,000 square feet of land. Cronkite News reporter Caitlin Greeno shares the benefits and the drawbacks if this ordinance passes. Well, contrary to what the pro-chicken people would like us to believe, chickens do smell. Michelle Tennyson is a realtor in Glendale. She says allowing to raise chickens in backyards would decrease property values in the home she sells. If I'm showing a house and I walk in the backyard and there's a chicken coop next door, I can tell you right now that unless I have somebody who purposely wants to live in a neighborhood with chickens, we're gonna, not going to spend more than five seconds in that house. The ordinance is making a few changes. If approved, it would allow residents to raise chickens in all single-family residential zoning districts of the city and removing the limits on the number of chickens in those zoning areas. As long as you upkeep them, you keep the pen clean, um, you provide fresh fruit and water daily, uh, you have a minimal amount, the smells, the noise, it's all irrelevant when it comes to backyard poultry. Other Glendale residents are concerned about the noise. Um, I can just see that it's got a lot, be a lot of noise. We're going to have more coyotes, hawks, flies. Just, it's going to be a potential danger to have a chicken in my yard or any of my neighbor's yards. 
Pratt's Pets and Feed is located in Glendale, and the general manager there wanted to debunk some chicken myths. One of the common misconceptions with poultry is that they're actually loud, which is actually not true at all. Poultry are actually quiet at night. They don't make any sounds. They roost, so you don't have the, the nuisance of noise from you with like a barking dog. No date has been set for when the ordinance will be voted on. In Glendale, Caitlin Greno, Cronkite News. Genetically modified organisms have been at the heart of controversy ever since the mid-90s. Cronkite News reporter David Caltabiano checked out the ground roots to GMOs as well as the alternatives. David? Yeah, not only are GMOs in the national spotlight with the most recent GMO labeling bill being signed in early August by, by President Obama, but here in Arizona, GMOs are being used to their maximum potential to yield the biggest results, which may have some consumers thinking of an alternative. Reading block right here of cotton. The University of Arizona's Maricopa Agricultural Center is working with agri-chemical company Monsanto to create genetically modified cotton. Again, we have BT cotton in here, so there's no caterpillar pests causing problem. Dr. Peter Ellsworth specializes in integrated pest management and works directly with GMOs. The very first outdoor planting of a GM cotton plant or crop was planted right here in this demonstration farm, uh, probably no more than a quarter mile from where we're sitting here today. Ellsworth says the crop was engineered with Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, a bacteria that fends off predators. People know them as woolly worms, and they came in and they were devouring the entire cotton crop. But the minute they got to the BT uh, plants in the center of the field, they could no longer damage the, the crop. Ellsworth says BT can eliminate the need for pesticides, which has saved farmers millions. The bacteria has also been implemented in other foods. Some of the same BT genes have been put into corn crops, uh, both corn crops that are used to feed livestock and animals, and as well as in sweet corn. Although genetically modified crops can eliminate the use of pesticides, 57% of Americans still feel unsafe eating foods with GMOs, according to the Pew Researchers study from 2014. I would think that it's probably more than 50%, 57%. Drew, along with GMO Free AZ, has made it their goal to educate Arizona on the dangers of GMOs. So I don't want people to go vote about this. I want people to vote with their dollars. I want them to go to the grocery store and buy appropriate uh, responsibly produce foods. <laughs> you know what this is for me? Pardon? In the midst of uncertainty, there is one man who isn't concerned with food production. That's because Greg Peterson grows his own food on his urban farm. People really want to know what's in their food. Peterson believes that's one of the reasons why urban farming is growing. And if they're raising it themselves, they know that there's no GMOs in it. They know that there's no chemicals or few chemicals uh, and they know that it's nutrient dense. They know it's good, healthy food. Peterson also teaches online courses on his website so others can grow food too. Actually, for the last 27 years, I've been growing food on the property. For the last 20 years, I've been showing people that they can do it themselves. The urban farm, what is in? completed with chickens, has everything a regular farm would have, along with the added benefit of knowing what's in your food. In Phoenix, David Coltabiano, Cronkite News. Mary Andrew supports the alternative of urban farming, whereas Dr. Ellsworth supports urban farming, but doesn't believe people should be turning down genetically modified food for urban farming. Live in downtown Phoenix, David Coltabiano, Cronkite News. The Navajo Nation is contributing to a popular fall activity. Reporter Sabella Scalise is outside of D.C. where choosing the best pumpkin means a little bit more. Picking out pumpkins is a fall tradition, but not every pumpkin travels thousands of miles to sit on a front porch. This may look like a normal pumpkin patch. Are you having fun? Yes. But every single one of these pumpkins came from the Pumpkin Patch Fundraiser Farm in New Mexico that sits in the Navajo Nation region. If you look at the price of the pumpkins, they're going to be a little bit higher than you would pay, such as at Walmart. But 
when they realize what they're supporting and the hard work and effort that went into growing the pumpkins. The farm is two square miles on the Navajo agriculture products industry farmland. The pumpkin farm employs over 700 Navajo farmers during harvest season. I can't believe it, you know, it's really nice to be able to help people. The CEO of the Navajo agriculture products industry says the pumpkin farm is just a small part of their large farmland, creating jobs and revenue for the Navajo Nation. Most pumpkin patches are like marked up really high and for profit, so it's kind of nice to have one that gives back. The extra cost reflects the business that grows top-notch pumpkins. It's just the size of them and the different variations has been, people have really been pleased with the, what they've been able to find. They're selling very well and people are excited when they hear that this is supporting that effort and that mission um, with the Navajo Indians in New Mexico. These pumpkins almost didn't make it because of a drought and a hailstorm. But that didn't stop the Navajo farmers and Pumpkin USA from bringing smiles all the way to the East Coast. In Fairfax, Virginia, Sabella Scalise, Cronkite News. Some bakeries across Arizona are busy this time of year making a special Day of the Dead bread. The holiday honors relatives who have passed away. Yesenia Beltran joins us to explain the significance of the bread. Dia de los Muertos has roots in Mexico, but it's growing in popularity in Arizona. Some people gather in cemeteries to remember their family members, and others put up altars in their homes. And there's also a special holiday bread. As we speak, people are lining up to buy pan de muerto. It takes a team of bakers working extra hours to prepare pan de muerto. They sell about 800 Day of the Dead breads on November 2nd alone. Lead baker and manager Jorge Romero says all types of people come in to buy the bread, not just Latinos. The bread is made from a special egg dough in a round shape with crisscross strips of dough forming bones and a skull in the center. This is the bread before it's all put together. Each part of the bread represents one part of the dead person's body. You'll have to let it sit for three hours before baking. It's baked in 310 degrees Fahrenheit, and after four hours, the result is this. Exquisito pan, sinceramente. Lourdes Sarabia de Olivas drove an hour and 15 minutes from Florence to West Phoenix to pick up her bread. Since childhood, it was instilled in me that this was a special day to be reunited with your loved ones. This time of year, the faithful believe the spirits of the dead return to celebrate with their families. The holiday is actually two days. November 1st is to remember children who have died, and November 2nd is for adults who have passed away. Yesenia Beltran, Cronkite News. The Phoenix Rescue Mission has invested its time in cookies to help the homeless population. Cronkite News reporter Alicia Gonzalez tells us how. Once I got past the smell of cookies baking in the oven, I was able to learn just how important those cookies can be to the families who came to the Phoenix Rescue Mission for help. My mom was doing bad, like she got into the habit, like she got addicted to drugs and then she came here to get me back and then when she got me back, then she and she worked in the kitchen for a little bit and then, and then they hired her to catering. Mason Rader has been living at the Phoenix Rescue Mission's Changing Lives Center for the past two years after being reunited with his mom. His mom is now the manager of Mission Possible Catering, which is the second of the two businesses created by the nonprofit. This program has changed my life completely. I mean, 100 percent. I am a completely different person, I think, of when, than when I walked through the doors. I mean, I feel that I have hope for my future. I have hope for my son that I can go out and do and become a part of society and be able to, um, to make my way with me and my child. Like other women at the center, Raider is a part-time employee who is getting training that will make the transition back into society much smoother. We don't want our graduates to graduate our program and then go flip burgers because that's not a sustainable wage. And many of the women here have children and they really can't support their families 
on a minimum wage job. So we're teaching them to go in at more of a manager level at a restaurant. Kathy Coca, executive project manager at the Phoenix Rescue Mission, says they are one of the few providing solutions to our valley's growing homeless population. I've never worked in a kitchen before I came here, ever. And now I'm like running this catering thing and we have girls that are clients that come into you know catering and they we rotate them out of the kitchen. So I'm constantly training new girls. The program usually takes about a year and graduates about 50 women each year. Phoenix Rescue Mission is in the process of developing a third business right now, which will extend their options to breakfast and lunch. In the Broadcast Center, Alicia Gonzalez, Cronkite News. Street vendors often work for themselves. Some are just one person selling food from a cart. Cronkite News reporter Yesenia Beltran joins us to talk about what it takes for these tiny vendors to make a living. The city of Phoenix requires all street vendors, no matter how small, to get a license. So far, they have issued 120 permits. Some vendors operate without a license because they feel it is difficult to qualify. Nearly every day, Marta Rojas pedals her cart through this West Phoenix neighborhood. When her loyal customers hear this sound, they flock to her cart. The kids love her mangoes, shaved ice, and of course, corn on the cob. I like it because she's nice. Martha has been a street vendor for 13 years and is originally from Puebla, Mexico. I like being here, working, meeting people, knowing the community. It's nice. She has faced many challenges and is one of the few women doing this job. People who rob, people who yell at you in the streets, all the people that are on drugs, that don't know and lose consciousness, we put ourselves out there to all those dangers. The mother of three has run into problems because she does not have a vendor's license. I don't have a license. The only license I have is from God. Rojas does not qualify because the city requires proof of legal immigration status. She says other longtime vendors are also operating without permits. Rojas dreams of becoming a citizen. One comes to this country to advance and move forward. Every person's dream, every parent's dream, because I have kids. Oh, I can't do it anymore. And while I've always dedicated myself to this. She hopes to open a storefront one day. Vendors operating without a license run the risk of getting a citation and having to pay a fine. The fine is determined by the courts and the city clerk told me that she is unable to provide the range because it runs on a case-by-case -case basis. Live in downtown Phoenix, Yesenia Beltran, Cronkite News. The Valley is home to a lot of food from around the world, including fusion restaurants that combine cuisine and culture. A new report by the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce shows Latinos spend more per capita than other groups eating out. And that influences the kind of restaurants we're seeing here in Phoenix. Cronkite News reporter Yami Flores sunk her teeth into the world of Mexican sushi. This is one of many restaurants in Phoenix that serves Mexican sushi. The rolls are a fusion between Mexican and Japanese ingredients. You need a rice maker, you need seaweed, you need a uh, fish, you need shrimp, you need uh, uh, cheese. The idea originally started in Mexico. Hernan Rivera Jr. and his father were the first to bring it to Phoenix. Mexican sushi basically is more spices, more steak, more chicken and it's fully cooked and it's deep fried. Sushi Sonora opened a second restaurant in March. Most of our target marketing is for the people that don't eat raw fish. Most of their customers are Hispanic and would much rather have cooked sushi. We do like the traditional one, but fried is our favorite. During the week they get a lot of to-go orders, but it's on the weekend when people wait up to an hour to try their most common dishes, such as Cielo Mar y Tierra. The recipe is a combination of steak, chicken, shrimp with avocado, and cream cheese. El sushi. <laughs> this El customer's sushi. favorite sushi is the deep fried shrimp. The appetite for Mexican sushi is growing. The Riveras now face competition from at least nine similar restaurants. In Phoenix, Jamie Flores, Cranca News. 
A different kind of Thanksgiving preparation is underway for one Arizona native turned master chef. Cronkite News reporter Claire Caulfield was in Washington, D.C. to see what he's bringing to the table. My name is uh, Freddie Butsui. I am the um, executive chef at Mitatom Cafe at the National Museum of the American Indian, Washington, D.C. And it makes me like food curator for a, a Native American food exhibition. Okay, so this is right here we have is the five region stamp with uh, sumac sauce. Living on the reservation, we only had access to five television stations. I'd watch the cooking shows and then I'd figure out, you know, what's going on and just learning from the, from the basics. But becoming a chef was something that was never really in my scope. And I um, went to a UNM branch in Gallup. And quickly, you know, declared my major as an anthropolo anthropology major and my minor as art history. And little did I know that those two disciplines would guide me toward food. What are the classic dishes that the native people have been making, like the classic dishes to Hopi, to Navajo, the classic dishes to Pueblo cultures? So if these plants and animals were to tell their story about how they started to be consumed throughout thousands of years, that's the story that I was um, looking to tell. The, the example that I always use, the tribes in Nova Scotia and Maine and Massachusetts had access to really good clams. So what they would do is they'd get the sunchokes and the clams and add it and cook it with seawater. So one of my signature dishes is a clam soup with, with leek. And truthfully, people say things like, how can that be Native American if you're adding leeks, thyme, bay leaf, and chicken stock? But my job as a chef is to tell you that there was an original dish hundreds of years ago, and because people were making that particular dish, it got carried on. So when the British came, and that's when they added their cream and their butter, and that's how we get uh, modern day New England clam chowder. Thanks for joining us for this Cronkite News special. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.